know that passing me and you. <laughs> 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 All right, are we good? Okay, sweet. Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, showing up today. Uh, my name is Alan. I wanted to thank Eileen for inviting you all here today. Um, of course, you're all master's students and into entrepreneurship and stuff, so I'm hoping to provide as much value as I possibly can today. Give you a little framework for how I was thinking about today would go. Uh, essentially, maybe the first 15 to 30 minutes, a little context building for Fruitcraft, how we got started, a little dovetail into the why of our company, and then just open it up for questions. Uh, ideally, a good 45 minutes of Q&A might get some real value out of that, so um, be prepared for that at the tail end of the chat. Um, before we do that, though, let me get right into the story of Fruitcraft and a little bit of our inspiration behind the what of what we do. It uh, looks like most people here are drinking some of our products. If you're drinking beer, it's just the one thing we're not allowed to make. It's okay if you prefer beer and you didn't buy one of our products. Maybe one day we'll <laughs> maybe one day we'll open up a craft brewery and it'll be a, you know some fruit driven stuff, some sours, whatever. But for now, this is a bonded winery, and we're allowed to legally make wine. Now we got our start making fruit wine, which we call wine from fruit, <laughs> mostly because fruit wine immediately informs sweet wine, and that couldn't be further from the truth. When you're talking about fermentation, which is happening in these bad boys. Uh, you're talking about a process that takes sugar, reduces the overall quantity of sugar, and creates another beautiful product. Who knows what it creates? <laughs> it's alcohol, is what it is. So it's pretty awesome. Um, but just, just to give you a little framework for that, we make red wine as well. And most of what people don't understand is that a wine grape like Cabernet, when you eat it, it's actually the sweetest fruit you've ever had in your entire life. There's no sweeter fruit you'll ever find in the grocery store, in the supermarket, none of that. When you go and take the sugar analysis of a wine grape, you'll see 25% sugar in that grape. Compare that to, say, a pineapple, which I think a lot of us think is a very sweet fruit. That's usually coming in at 12 to 14% sugar. So the misnomer of that fruit wine category is really the reason why we're making cider and hard kombucha and mead is because all you all don't get it. <laughs> and that's a fight that we were trying to have for literally eight years of our existence. And since we couldn't get through the marketplace, we went on Shark Tank. We pinched the sharks. They didn't get it. We pitched hundreds of wine buyers. They didn't get it. And it's all because of the misnomers and the lack of education around the science of fermentation. A little bit more on that note. Anybody know what the most ancient of all alcohols is? Guesses? Wow. Yeah, mead. mead, great guess. That was, nice. yeah, that was your guess as well. And that is, a, that is put out by the mead industry, by the by. <laughs> they wanna say it's the most ancient, because it, there's a lo long history of it, and more importantly, you, you can actually find some pots with uh, you know, some ancient residues and this, that, and the other, but there's one really important scientific discovery that we can look towards to really inform which was the original alcohols and if, uh, is it, anyone here ever been to prison? Okay, so just me. Um, no. <laughs> you can, does anybody know what they make alcohol out of in prison? Okay. Anybody seen Orange is the New Black? <laughs> All right, it's like orange juice, it's sugars, it's fruit. That's what happens. You're taking sugar, it's converting into alcohol. The main source of sugar you're going to find in jail or in prison is going to be just <laughs> fruit they have on their little trays. So um, now, has anyone ever typed in drunk animals into Google or into YouTube? That's a fun one. That's a fun one. And there's something you'll discover there as well, which is even to this day, animals will go find fermenting fruit in the Sahara and these places that it's naturally occurring. And it'll be fermenting on the trees because it's hot and the right things are happening. And these animals will getting drunk. So. The lesson there is actually the original of all types of alcohols is fruit-based alcohol. If you were to get into a time machine and you went back 6,000 years ago, what you would find is they were just at that moment inventing beer. And this all coincided with the agricultural revolution when we finally discovered you can plant seeds, put them in rows, harvest, and have these efficiencies tied to it. 
That's when grains became a commonly used ingredient in mankind's consumption. And that, and that was when we started boiling those grains in order to get them to be fermentable by the yeast to turn into beer. Same thing can be said of sake. Sake is a very ancient beverage, but it goes back to the point where we're boiling and we're farming. Up until that time, what were we doing? We were hunting, we were gathering, and fruit was naturally existing in the environments in which we were there, and it was fermenting in the environments in which we were there. It's a spontaneous process. It's the only alcoholic beverage that happens spontaneously. Beer has to have mankind intervening to create it. Sake has to have mankind intervening, and everything else pretty much besides fruit-based stuff. Now, mead, <laughs> the way you make mead is you've got a hugely hugely high sugar content in the form of honey, it's not going to ferment on its own. It's not a spontaneously fermented thing. You have to take that honey, you have to dilute it. So could it have happened spontaneously? Yes. Did it happen as frequently as fruit did? No. Because you would need rain to mix with the honey to like just accidentally dilute it to the, to the place where it can be fermented. So little education, that is a big reason of why we're doing what we're doing. If you get into the nuts and bolts of entrepreneurship as you try to come up with ideas and try to bring products to market, one of the big questions that's going to become a surface for you is, does this product deserve to exist? Hands down, fruit-based alcohol, in my mind, deserve to exist, which is why for the last 10 years I've been trying to bring that product to market. Now, we do make cider, we make hard kombucha, we make mead, we make spirits, we make all these other products. But my first love, and hopefully my last love, will be fruit wine, wine from fruit. I think it's the highest quality of all alcohols, and it's the most flavorful and the best for you at the same time. So hold your questions for that. Uh, that was just the, a little bit of the what. The other important part of our what is probably more like how we're monetizing and how we're building our revenue and what we're doing around that. And uh, so it'll, help, it'll be very helpful for you guys since you're you know, in uh, MBA class and you're looking at entrepreneurship. But it's essentially, yes, we are a bar, restaurant, winery where people can come buy food and drink from us. But we have two other core revenue channels that really drive our company and drive our growth. Uh, the second is memberships. Uh, if you've ever been to Temecula or to Napa or any other wine region and you get good and drunk, they're going to try to sell you on that membership. That's because that's <laughs> the way they monetize. And that's really important for them because they, these models are based on agro-tourism. And if you are in the boondocks and you have to depend on people coming, it's good to turn them into a long-term customer by building them into a subscription model. You know, whether it's Dollar Shave Club or whatever, really the original of subscriptions were like wine clubs and newspapers. So I think it's a, it's a great thing that we've incorporated a subscription model into our uh, business model. Uh, but lastly, it's the thing that has been building our business more than anything kind of happened randomly when we invested into these plants and these live edge tables, but it's events. We do a bunch of baby showers, a bunch of bridal showers, but more importantly, we do more weddings than anything else. What you don't see in this room is the spaces next door. We took over the neighbors earlier this year. They've got a back patio that we renovated, and now that's our outdoor ceremony space. I think we've converted some 40 or 50 weddings uh, in the last year, and it's really been driving us like crazy. So. Um, kind of fun because our product offering isn't just the alcohol itself, it's the experience of the tasting room, but it's also the venue itself by way of events and the community we've built by way of memberships. So, Now that's all good and well. That is our what, but our why is really why I hope you're here today and it's what I get goosebumps when I start talking about. And it's because I believe that business as it stands now has a lot of growing and changing to do. Uh, when you look at the foundations of business, you really have to look at the foundations of capitalism itself. And while capitalism has allevi alleviated poverty and created all these great outcomes, it also has concentrated wealth. It has also devastated some environmental considerations. And there's been some negative outcomes that unhindered capitalism has really done more damage in some senses than it's done good. So when I look at the mission of business at large, not just the mission of fruit craft, my hope is that business will change its agreements, it'll change the fabric of why it is doing what it's doing, so that the outcomes of business would be entirely fair, entirely sustainable, and really built on a foundation of instead of self-interest, which is what capitalism, the theory of capitalism is built on, 
built on a new type of self-interest which takes the fullness of what the human experience is, which for me comes with giving instead of taking. You know, when you're really going about life and you're listening to your body, God, man, I need to take a chill pill, I'm going to rest, I'm going to take an off day, whatever. You're listening to your body and you're doing what it wants, and that's a selfish act. It's a necessary act, right? It's, this is the whole uh, self-care days, right? Same thing with your mind. We get tired, life is stressful, turn on Netflix, chill out, you're good. But we have another part of us. It's our soul, it's our spirit, it's the part of us that doesn't get tickled, doesn't get its needs met by doing things for ourselves, like feeding ourselves or watching TV, but it gets tickled when you do for others in a selfless way. And so that new part of the human experience, which is an old part, is got to be brought into the fabric of business itself. I think if I were to use a word to describe that, it would be love. Kind of cheesy, but I actually think about the reason why business exists. And I think about the reason why we exist. And I don't think that it's all accidental. This is just me personally. But the reason why this company has adopted this business model, the reason why we're moving forward in the way that we are, is that I believe there's a broader story to the human narrative. And that story has to do with we're better together than we are apart. Together we can solve all the problems that society has. If there's one thing I've learned as an entrepreneur, is that there is literally not a single problem I've encountered that you cannot find some creative solution to. And so if that's the case with just one entrepreneur running a business, I think collectively as a society, we can solve every problem from cancer to whatever, but we need to change the agreements, specifically in business, to make that possible. Case in point, how many pharmaceutical companies or insurance companies do you think want to cure cancer? They make hundreds of millions of dollars off of chemotherapy and off of all the stuff that they do. There's no incentive. Why? Because they're operating out of that paradigm that what's good for me is all that matters and it doesn't matter what's good for everybody else. So this small tweak in why business exists, does it exist for yourself or does it exist for your community? Does it exist to bring fulfillment to yourself? And that's really at the heart of the questions that I've been asking at the heart of this social value enterprise business model that I'll continue to unfold as we get into some questions. To give you a little um, kind of the how of this business, let me explain the, the way that it really goes against the concentration of wealth, which is exactly what you get with most businesses. Um, what's happening in most businesses is you have a founder and some investors, then you've got employees and consumers, and as employees and consumers kind of do their thing, the beneficiaries of the surplus of commerce end up being the founders and the investors. And this, over the course of years and years and years, concentrates wealth and it makes people billionaires, and it doesn't really take into account those other two constituents, employees and consumers. Now when you think about you know, who the masses are, who's out there in the world, we all know that we're consumers, we buy our coffee, our tea, we do our things every single day and every single week. And we also are employees, you know, we, we know what it means to labor, but we don't always think about that investor hat and we don't always think about that founding hat. It's because that's a much smaller portion of our life and it's a much smaller portion of the market itself. Um, and so I believe that the ownership of business shouldn't be exclusive to founders and owners. I think it should include employees and I think it should include consumers. And so the way we're going about re-engineering business and inviting consumers and employees into the ownership is by taking the shares that I deserve and have worked my tail off for the last 10 years and folding them into a trust that we're adding employees as owner beneficiaries and consumers as owner beneficiaries, both of which there's a path to getting there. It's not like a new hire from the day one becomes an employee owner. But when someone demonstrates the qualities of ownership, which really just comes down to working hard, not taking a paycheck, those are the things that all founders deal with. And if anyone in the company is willing to work harder than the amount they're taking home, then they'll be living the same life I've been living for the last 10 years. And they'll find themselves getting promoted. They'll find themselves with decision-making capacity within the organization. And they'll be essentially um, moving along in the way that I'd like to incentivize within the enterprise. The consumers, on the other hand, it really does, there's an agreement there. The reason they would become an owner in the company 
isn't because they're producing more labor and more productive value, but it's because they're consuming with loyalty. So it's pretty straightforward. You know, we're going to be engineering it along probably $1,000 a year, gets you into the ownership. Um, and that's just something we would track over the course of you frequenting the establishment weekly, monthly, however often, however often you might end up doing that. I think with that in mind, um, the other component of this and what I've just described is essentially a cooperative. Uh, Co-ops are community owned and typically they're organized as consumer cooperatives or employee cooperatives. But this is kind of the hybrid of the two. The only caveat I have there, and this comes back down to what I've seen in certain cooperatives, as great as it is to be community owned, you can get into the same pitfalls and, and the same shortcomings if you think the same way that a self-interested person would if it was owned by an individual. And that is, let's take all the profits this company produces and let's distribute it amongst ourselves. That actually doesn't embody what I'm looking to accomplish because I believe what got us into the economic messes that we're in essentially is that paradigm. So what we have to be asking is what's best for others. That's what love begs and that's what this business model tries to do. And so essentially what we're doing is instead of taking all the surplus profits and distributing it to consumers and to employees, we're taking that surplus profits and we're putting it out in $100,000 grants to help other people start community-owned companies. This is really important, but it's designed to provide alternatives for all of us who are conscious consumers who want to say, you know what, I could buy this wine from this guy who's already a billionaire, or I could buy it from this local company that's owned by the community, and when they produce profits, it gets redistributed back to the community, not only through some clever profit sharing with the employees and the consumers, but more importantly, with taking the vast majority of the surplus the business produces and retooling that to create common good by leveling the playing field for people to start businesses.